Welcome back to panel three. Hope you enjoyed your lunch. What we'll be doing is effectively this afternoon talking about the city, but also fundamentally the city and its environment and the energy environment nexus. What we'll be doing also is hearing from a distinguished and, and quite authoritative panel uh, on these topics. And what I'm most excited about is we're really, in a way, very focused, and we're focused on two quite large living labs, India uh, and China. As a political scientist, I'm, I'm interested in that largely because they're so different, right, politically. So we're talking about the world's largest democracy and the world's largest authoritarian regime. And we're talking about those, er those places. I think the discussion will be very much about place. Um, in really in two levels of analysis, that national level of analysis, uh, and also at the, the local or the municipal level of analysis. As I, and I'll, I'll make a, just a quick comment and I'll turn it over to our speakers. Um, what you'll, I think, see today is we'll start off with, a, with Karen Sito, who's a professor at, at Yale in geography and urbanization, and I'm, I will also add a proud graduate of uh, my department here at Boston University, so I'll plug, plug us there. So we're, we'll take credit for everything she does uh, moving forward and in the past. Uh, and Karen is going to be focused fundamentally on a comparison between India and China on urbanization patterns. You'll see uh, great slides that she's um, organized for, for today, and really talking about the implications, focusing on a lot of the implications for energy intensity, uh, for land use change, between those patterns and between those, those two uh, countries. Second, we'll turn to Susie, Susie Foster, who's a, a professor in the School of Public Health here in Boston University, and she's going to keep that level of analysis comparing China and India as well, but rather looking at specifically the impact uh, of urbanization and in some ways modernization um, and, and looking at, on the more depressing side of the ledger, the health impacts, uh, particularly of, sort of high caloric foods and, and uh, effectively the, their impact on uh, obesity, um, both obesity on, on, on really on, on the one hand, um, but also uh, the, if you look at on, on the, her India uh, comparison, she's going to be talking about uh, smoke uh, and smoking habits and their impact on health. So, so that's um, what Susie will, will cover. And then finally, we're going to end with the, from a perspective of optimism with Madhu, who's going to focus on India, but at the municipal level, Kolkata, and specifically the city level responses to sea level change, to climate change, uh, and more importantly, the use of wetlands and some of the more imaginative responses there. Just a few uh, comments uh, as, I, I, as I thought through the, the different panelists and, and what they will present in terms of food for thought. There are obviously considerable implications as we go through this, um, these comparisons. One is, I think, underlying is a political uh, discussion and political implications. So to what extent we, we believe that these, in many ways, diffuse but increasingly uh, exacerbated costs of urbanization um, are they becoming at the local or at the national level really agents of political change? Right? So we see, for example, that underlying theory played out frequently. As a China specialist, I see it particularly in China at the level of air pollution. To what extent is that diffuse problem shared by many strata of society a real agent of change? Do we have any uh, historical cases of air pollution becoming an agent for political change. Many would argue not, despite the, the, the arguments that we've heard on the political side. Social implications. I think one of the other uh, threads through our, our conference thus far is really whether, is a question uh, of whether cities are becoming centers really increasingly of just self-help. So is it that the costs are borne by the many, the benefits are borne and received by the few, particularly in India and China, um, and that led to discussions we had earlier which it, around whether government is equipped to make those partnerships uh, to be able to fill in much of the gap if these cities are becoming centers of, of self-help. And then lastly, so economic uh, implications. One of the things that to me seems so fascinating about this nexus between urbanization and the environment, and indeed climate, is that urbanization in many ways, and I think we'll see it um, particularly in, in some of Karen's comments, is in some ways fueling climate change, right? So as we see increased uh, energy use, as we see 
many, the area, right, where are many cities being located on, on the water, on sources of water and transport, it's that fueling of changes in the climate that then paradoxically undermines uh, or, or increases the fragility of these centers of economic growth. And so then we have these questions, as we just saw recently in the media or relating to Boston's recent study, uh, having potentially canals uh, down Clarendon Street here in Boston uh, in terms of adapting proactively. So there's sort of those political, social, and economic implications that are, I, I think run through this. Uh, and I'm really excited to turn us uh, the discussion over to the speakers. What we're going to do, just to remind everyone, speakers will have 15 minutes each, and then we'll that will give us time, about 40 minutes or so, for Q&A. And what I'll probably do is just collect a few questions, and then we'll have answers, and then we'll, we'll move uh, according to that. So with that, I'll turn over to Professor Cito. Well, wonderful. Well, thank you, Edward, for the invitation. I want to thank both Edward and Tony Judeos for the invitation to come back. In fact, this is the first time I've come back to my alma mater to give a talk. <laughs> um, and when I did my graduate work here more than 20 years ago, uh, there was no one here doing urban Asia. And so I am delighted that there's a new, new initiative on cities and that there's a conference. So it, it makes me really proud that, well, we, uh, that we, Boston University, has uh, this conference and I'm delighted to be here. Um, so Edward told me that we had 15 minutes to, and I thought 15 minutes to summarize about 14 years of research gives me about a, a slide and a half per year, roughly. Um, when I was here at Boston University, I started my uh, doctorate research looking primarily at, in South China. I looked at a number of cities uh, listed here, uh, Shenzhen, Guangzhou, et cetera. Um, and after I left BU, um, my first faculty position, I went out to California at Stanford, and I kept hearing um, that there was this place out in India that was the Silicon Valley of India. And in fact, at Stanford, we had a number of visitors come from India to visit the Silicon Valley of the United States. And so eventually I thought, you know, I better go visit this place that's the Silicon Valley of, of India. And at that point, I had already expanded the, the work in China to other cities. And I kept hearing comparisons between Bangalore and Silicon Valley and Bangalore and Shenzhen, which at that point was already starting to be talked about as the Silicon Valley of China. Um, I'll just say in a nutshell that Bangalore, Palo Alto, and Shenzhen are radically different places. <laughs> um, and that probably is best for discussion at the reception. Um, but I wanted to give you some context of where I've done field work, um, and, and I'm going to try to summarize this work in just a few slides. I have three main take-home points about this, the work that I've been doing and thinking about comparing China with India and where their similarities are. And the first take-home point is one that pr really corroborates what all the other panelists have been saying, is that what's happening in China and India is fundamentally different from what we've seen in North America, what we've seen in OECD, European countries, and largely because of the scale. I think the, the word scales come up probably about 12 times. I was counting them. Um, but also the rate of change, right? The, the scale in terms of the size, but scale in terms of the number, and then the, the rate of transformation. And here, I want to underscore that it's not just about population growth, but really the transformation of ideas and livelihoods and ways of being. Um, here's one scale number that I, I quite like. Um, over the next 15, 20 years, depending on whose forecast you believe, uh, China and India combined will add about 700 million people in their cities, urban places. Uh, we're already at a point where about, or nearly one third of all urban residents on the planet live in one of these two cities. So in terms of the global impact, it's really clear that what happens in China's and India's cities has not only a local impact, but really a, this global impact. I want to give this example of a, a different example of scale, though, not just in terms of people, but just of the footprint. And this is something that's come up a couple of times with the panelists. 
Uh, London is about 610 square, uh, 610 square miles. A few years ago, there was a proposed megacity in uh, southern China. This is the area where I actually did my dissertation research. And the proposed area of this megacity would have been 16,000 square miles. So I think this really raises some very interesting questions around governance, around livability, around planning, whether planning can be done at this scale. So that's just sim simply take on one that I, I don't want to um, um, bear on too much, but that w what's happening there is really different than what we're seeing in other places. Um, the second take home point, though, is that these two countries are also radically different from each other. And um, I, I want to just tell you the story of probably the first few years that I did research in India. Uh, at that point, I'd been doing research in China for about 10 years. So I went to India and I started meeting with officials and ministers. And without a doubt, almost every person I spoke with the first time I met them would find some avenue to say, well, you know, India is not China because we're a democracy. And after working in India for many years, I realized, yes, India is not China because it's a democracy, and also because the underlying processes of urbanization there are very, very different, as well as the way, they is the way that urbanization manifests itself. So I think sometimes we get caught up in the scale number, and we say, oh, look at these big urban giants, and uh, big countries are both in Asia, um, but actually when you spend even a little bit of time in either of these places, you dig a little bit deeper, you realize that they are really different. And it, in some ways, it does an enormous injustice to start comparing these urban processes in these two places. In terms of thinking about the environment, though, there are some really important differences in terms of impacts on local and global environments. So if you look at this graph here, uh, the, what, what we see is that in 1950, India's urbanization levels were relatively low at about 17% of the total population. The most recent UN estimate suggests that the urban population will reach about 52% at the middle of this century. So what we're seeing in India is a slow ramp up of urbanization. The, the process that's underway has just begun. What we're seeing in China is something that's quite different. China back in 1950 had actually a much lower level of urbanization, lower than India, but that the level of urbanization has actually surpassed that of India at a, uh, uh, more recently. And, and that what we're seeing in the case of China is that much of the urban, urban infrastructure development, much of the uh, development of buildings, of roads, of the built environment, that's gonna take a lot of energy emit a lot of emissions, much of that's going to be over by the middle of the century. They are, the, the, government, the country is really going through a third, and some would argue, a fourth wave of urbanization in terms of rebuilding the infrastructure that they started building in the late 70s and the late 80s. In contrast, what we're going to see in the case of India is that their large-scale urban development, infrastructure development, and investments really only going to be started around the middle of this century. So I think this is going to be interesting for us to talk about and discuss um, in terms of thinking about uh, the timing of the environmental impacts at global scales. Um, I just want to show this two pictures that to me really highlight these differences between urbanization in India and urbanization in, in, uh, in China. So in both countries, urban centers are, are dense places in terms of economic activity, in terms of people. But if we think about the built environment, they are really different. So here's a, an example uh, of, of a pretty indicative of many Indian city centers that are dense in terms of activities and people, but where the built environment is primarily three to four stories. What we're seeing in China, though, is a rebuilding of urban centers, in many cases a literal move of the CBD, a new city halls. Most Chinese capitals, provincial capitals, have moved their city halls to a newer place, usually across the river. Um, and, and what we're seeing is that there's a lot more of um, high-rise development, residential development in the city center. And in terms of thinking about the environmental impact, um, these are going to be quite different because in the Chinese case, we're seeing a lot of 
um, clusters of residential development, but not a lot of mixture of residential and commercial development all through, you know, throughout the entire urban fabric. So what we're seeing is more disconnection or more spaces between where people work and uh, where they live. So, um, you know, this take take home two take home point two is that you know these these drivers are very different. The the impacts are going to be very different. I want to just spend a minute talking about this uh, meta study that we had done a few years ago, looking at whether population or economic activity. How the how economic activity and population movements and migration actually affects the growth of these two countries, and one of the things that was surprising um, to see statistically, but not surprising based on our work in the field, is that in the China case, much of the urban expansion, the physical expansion, is driven by uh, the growth in GDP, and that's really uh, you can see this here in the far right column that the GDP per capita growth rate drives more than half of the urban expansion. But in the India case, what we're seeing is, is that urban expansion is primarily driven by people moving into the city. It's not really the growth of economic activity. So I wanted to just highlight that meta study to illustrate that these drivers are very different, the processes are very different, um, and the way that they're being manifested are really different. The third main take home point that I want to illustrate is, and, and this really corroborates something that Gavin said, I think a theme in his presentation, is that um, we tend to think of urban development as something that's often bottom up um, and that local actors have a role. And, and, and by local, I mean it could be even national governments, like Beijing having a role on what happens in Western China. But what we are seeing, if you actually look at the data, if you look at um, the timing of development is that non-local actors are playing an, an increasing role. And these non-local actors are uh, companies like master planning agencies and real estate companies. Um, I just want to highlight that in 2009, C.B. Richard Ellis, which is one of the world's largest real estate companies, had $97 billion worth of transactions. That's about the size of the Puerto Rican economy. And C.B. Richard Ellis is only one of many uh, real estate companies. We've done work with, um, where is Jones Lang LaSalle, working with them to understand how they broker whether Microsoft moves to Bangalore or Hyderabad or Pune and within the country or within the city where they decide to move. So these non-local actors in both countries are, are, sh are, are shaping development. Um, and, and shaping the way in which cities are planned and, and uh, designed. Um, one thing that was surprising to me, this is probably about 10 years ago in Chennai, meeting with a high-level official there, I mean, he, he said that part of his goal for Chennai at that point was to um, make Chennai the Detroit of India. Now, he was also clear the Detroit of the 1940s. Um, <laughs> and, Arguably, he's been very successful. He and his team have been very, very successful in bringing BMW, Ford Motors, and a number of um, international automobile companies there. Um, I have this picture on the far left here from, taken from um, a development in, in Bangalore, outside of Bangalore. Um, and one of the ways in which these non-local drivers shape urban development in these places is the role of NRIs these non-resident Indians who go back and they might have been living in Silicon Valley or Redmond, Washington or Boston, and then they go back and they live, not all of them, but some of them live in enclaves like these, which then certainly have an impact on the local population in terms of what the local population aspires to live in. So I think there's this really interesting domino effect in terms of these non-local actors. Um, but there's a lot of local, when I say local, domestic actors that are not co-located with the city that they're developing. Let me just repeat that because it might be a little confusing. There are a number of domestic actors that are shaping cities that they have very little foothold in. So, you know, we think of Boston being developed by people who live in Boston, who go to the planning meetings and, and, and have a, um, maybe a, a voice in how Boston gets developed. And so in my previous slide, I was saying that 
companies like Jones Lang LaSalle and, and um, SOM, let's say Skidmore, Owings, and Merrill, have a big role in shaping these cities, but it's not just foreign firms. That's my point. It could be a lot of national firms as well. And in this case, in the Indian case, we see that DLF, which is one of the largest real estate developers in, in India, is creating a certain type of uh, urban development, you know, thinking about the first panel about the idea of the city. DLF is shaping uh, a new idea of the city that remarkably actually harkens back to a colonial past, which I think is particularly interesting. So they have a number of developments called things like King's Court and Queen's Court. But this type of development and reimagining of, of urban life is, is, is actually something that is common between China and India. This is a development in China with, uh, I don't know if people in the back can, can read it, but th this development has uh, neighborhoods called Knightsbridge, uh, Hampstead, and Kensington. So if you just saw the model, you would think that you were in the UK, but you're actually in, in China. So those are my three main take home points that I just wanted to um, start the discussion with um, in terms of you know, how China and India are a little bit different. I wanna spend a few minutes talking about the environmental impacts of what's happening in both of these countries. And I have here a slide that shows a, a number of the environmental impacts of urbanization, whether it's um, congestion and, and local pollution, uh, local pollution and, and also the resources required to build the environment, the build the built environment. I think that's something that we often don't think about uh, and, and consider in terms of urbanization is what's the energy and raw materials required to build all the roads and build all the buildings and it's pretty substantive. Agricultural land loss here is a, is a really big issue in both countries and in fact my own research started off using remote sensing to look at the growth of cities in China and the loss of agricultural land. We just finished a study in India that, that illustrates that a very similar pattern is happening in India that very productive lands around big cities are being lost to urban development. Uh, of course, another big issue um, in, in both countries is the loss of uh, habitat and especially fragmentation of habitat and what that means for biodiversity loss. Um, a lot of altered, uh, altered hydrological systems and uh, polluted uh, hydrological systems. And then, of course, in terms of thinking about climate change, um, the impacts of urbanization on emissions are, are increasingly clear. So I have a few grand challenges that I think are common to both countries in terms of thinking about sustainable urbanization as a environmental strategy. Okay, so how can urbanization be sustainable both for local development but also in terms of thinking about planetary sustainability? So I think one of the large ones is around vehicle ownership, private vehicle ownership. And, and in, in the case of China, we the numbers are very clear that private vehicle ownerships have, have really skyrocketed in the last 20 years uh, associated with increases in disposable income. If you look at the same data for India, you don't see the same trend, but largely because it's this lag effect and the income growth is not at the same rate. Um, but again, if we think back to my earlier slide about um, India's urban transition really happening over the next 20 to 30 years, we're gonna see a very similar pattern. Many of you uh, who are China scholars, China watchers uh, probably are familiar with this uh, world-renowned uh, traffic jam that, that occurred in Beijing a few years ago um, and you thought your commute was bad. So a uh, traffic jam that lasted about nine days. And I think this really begs the question of what type of planning, both in terms of urbanization, but as well as economic development and transport planning, is gonna be necessary to ease or reduce the occurrences of, of, of this type of uh, uh, congestion and, and also pollution. I think that a second major challenge is around energy and water. Um, and, and in this area, it's not only adequate energy and water supply, but also about clean water supply and clean energy supply. And I think here, a lot of the discussion, especially in terms of the IPCC, has been about transforming the energy supply. 
And I think we need to have a very different and parallel discussion about the use of energy and the use of water. Because <clears throat> what we're seeing in the data is a real big jump, at least with the China data, in the use of energy and water and the increase in the inefficient use of energy and water. So I think we got to think about both the supply end and, and, the, and the demand end. Um, of course, a couple of years ago, uh, there was one of the world's largest uh, blackouts that occurred in India uh, in the summer. About uh, 600 million-ish people were without power for a couple of days. So I think uh, going back to some of the uh, other panelists thinking about climate change and climate change adaptation, I think one of the big questions for these both of these countries as they urbanize is you know, how do they continue to provide adequate energy and water given that these types of power outages are more likely to increase in the future. So it's not just about sea level rise and storm surges, but also that in a hotter world, we're going to be stressing our grid a lot more. And so we're going to have millions of urban dwellers and people in the countryside as well who uh, are, are not going to have access to power. I think one of the, the big questions in the room, I hope, <laughs> and certainly um, in terms of thinking about climate change is, how will urbanization affect energy use and greenhouse gas emissions going forward? Um, we just finished the, the fifth assessment report, and I led the chapter on uh, how cities can mitigate climate change. And we did a pretty exhaustive and an intensive look at um, China's energy footprint as well as India's energy footprint. And I want to just highlight this chart that's in the IPCC report from the cities chapter. On the, on the left um, is a graph that shows Annex I countries. And on the y-axis, it's the final um, energy consumption per capita. <clears throat> and so these Annex I countries, are, for all intents and purposes, are developed countries, OECD countries. And what you see here on the left is that per capita energy use in developed countries are, on average, lower than national averages. So this is a statistic that you hear quite a bit if you read the work of urban economists who argue that, well, cities are much more efficient than the countryside. So the graph on the left pr supports that argument because per capita energy use in OECD countries is lower than national averages. But if you look on the graph on the right, it actually tells a completely different story that in non annex one countries, we see that per capita energy use is much higher than national averages. And for those of us who work in development, it's not surprising because in developing countries, the rest of the world or the rest of the country has very little modern energy. So of course, national averages are low. I think this, this duality here really, these, the, 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 um, these two graphs really highlight the challenge going forward in terms of how both of these countries will urbanize and their potential impacts on, on energy use and emissions. There's been a lot of discussion today about density. That word's come up a number of times. Um, and it's clear from the IPCC report that um, one of the big challenges moving forward in terms of thinking about environmental sustainability is to increase accessibility and land use mix within cities. It's not about increasing density, even though that seems to be the metric that a lot of people like to use. This is another graphic taken from the IPCC chapter that shows the same density in three very different configurations. And these three very different configurations lead to very different energy uses and, and emissions. Um, and likewise, uh, these three uh, cartoons illustrate the same percentage of land uses, um, but very different mixture of land uses, which have very different impacts on energy use and emissions. My fourth and final grand challenge for sustainable urbanization in both of these countries is the need to develop local models of urbanization. This is a development outside of Beijing that, again, looks like something out of England. Um, those of you might have thought that Cape Cod was in Massachusetts, but actually it's right outside of Bangalore. Um, there's a lot of development that is a cut and paste mentality. I had a conversation with someone at, during the lunch about you know, what developers are doing. And you know, this cut and paste mentality is very profitable, but whether it is the most appropriate strategy uh, remains to be seen. I am going to end with a positive note 
And my positive note is that I think there's a tremendous opportunity still to shape the built environment. In the case of China, a lot of the infrastructure has already been laid out, a lot of the roads, the buildings, et cetera. But as I mentioned earlier, they're in their third and arguably fourth phase of urban development. And the Chinese government has shown a lot of, well, they, they have a, a proven track record of rebuilding um, and, and tearing down and rebuilding old city centers. So many of the cities of tomorrow in both of these countries have yet to be built and have yet to be rebuilt. So I think that going forward, there's a lot, uh, there's a lot of uh, possibilities for shaping urban development that will be more sustainable and certainly have less environmental impact. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. So we'll now uh, shift to Professor Susan Foster, Susie, uh, again from the School of Public Health here at BU, and she will look at uh, the issue of diabetes and also uh, tobacco use and, and their health effects. Well, thank you very much. Um, very happy to be here. My talk today is I'm going to focus on, uh, for, for time reasons and also because these are the two largest problems that we're really facing, uh, the issues around diabetes and, uh, and obesity and lifestyle changes and tobacco use. Um, the city has a lot of lures. My, I, I titled my talk uh, Perils and Promise, I think, of, of urbanization. And there are a lot of pull, things pulling people to the urban areas, work, the, the possibility of getting an education for your kids, um, improved health, uh, access to health care, electricity, water, and so on. But there are also a lot of push factors, and I think these have been covered probably in uh, a lot of the talk this morning that I was unable to, uh, to attend. And um, some of those bring with them their own uh, health and public health issues. I also thought I would I don't know whether someone has shown this little uh, graphic at the bottom of the slide here. This really caught my eye about sometime last year when I saw this, that within this l highlighted circle, half of the world's population is living there. And that is really the area that we're talking about now. It's quite a striking graphic. It really caught my attention. It was actually posted on Facebook. And I, I reposted it and shared it for all my friends to see. Um, Non-communicable diseases are really uh, displacing um, communicable diseases as the main causes of morbidity and mortality in, in Asia as well as other places. Um, I, and as I said, I'm going to focus on the issues around obesity and, and lifestyle and then smoking. Starting first with diabetes in India, um, India has uh, a very high rate of uh, diabetes, in part due to obesity, but also there are some other things going on. There's a genetic predisposition towards uh, developing diabetes type 2 um, at an earlier age and at a lower uh, body mass index, or BMI, than is true of people in other parts of the world. And this means that um, the, the numbers of people, not so much in their 60s, but in their 40s and 50s, who are developing type 2 diabetes are really increasing very, really rapidly. And the cost of providing care for these people is falling primarily on the individuals in their households. It's not so much government that is covering these costs of care and of lost productivity, but it's the households themselves that are having to cope with this. Um, Street food, once people move to the urban areas, and if they're employed, especially in, say, a downtown area, they've had to commute from their uh, housing, which may be on the periphery, they're going to possibly be relying on street food for a lot of their um, nutritional intake. And if you look at it, a lot of it is fried. It's um, partly for palatability, and it, it stores well, and it also uses less energy to produce a fried food. You can do it quickly, people will buy it because it's tasty, and at the same time, it's not really very good for you. So we have sort of that uh, trend which is uh, present. And then we also have the trend, as elsewhere in the world, of uh, the fast food uh, restaurants being becoming very prominent. Um, I've chosen a couple pictures here. One is from uh, a McDonald's up in the upper uh, right corner, and then the lower one is an Indian uh, Indian, I guess, owned store, um, Aditi Fast Food. And these, again, primarily serve high fat, high sugar um, 
foods that are that are palatable and but which are not particularly good for for uh, the body. This uh, graph is from a paper by uh, Mohan et al., which was in the Indian Journal of Medical Research, showing the projected rise of diabetes in India. And you can see that from about 32 million in 2000, they are projecting that by 2025, there'll be nearly 70 million people with diabetes. And by 2030, just five years later, 80 million people in India with diabetes. That is a lot of people who are going to require care of various types. You'll have a lot of people who will not get that care in time and will end up with some of the more um, damaging side effects and sequelae of diabetes, such as amputations, blindness, and so on. And, and that leads to the need for dialysis, the need for rehabilitation care, and so on. So this is a very, a very, a very expensive problem that we're looking at. Not to mention that someone who goes blind in their 40s or 50s is going to be much less employable, much, is, much less uh, able to do their own, uh, support themselves and their families, and is going to be really uh, a, a potentially going from a productive member of society to possibly someone who is not able to be productive. So this is a large problem that's, uh, that is looming on the horizon. I mentioned that the cost of this care is largely being borne by the families and the individuals themselves. And I highlighted in this sort of, well, greenish yellow bar, it was yellow in another incarnation, the percentage of out-of-pocket payments that people are spending. Now this is actually from a paper that covered both diabetes and cardiovascular care. So this is actually cardiovascular care, not diabetes, but these are for hospitalizations. But just by way of saying, for the lowest 40% of the income group, this out-of-pocket expenditure is approximately a quarter of their total income. That's a lot of money to be, to having to divert from other costs of school fees for the kids, food, other types of health care, possibly upgrading your housing and so on. And that is going to be going to um, care, in this case for the cardiovascular, but we see the same pattern for um, diabetes. And it can also lead to, to bankruptcy. If you have um, this amount of uh, expenditure going, it's just not a sustainable thing for that family, and often it will lead to a bankruptcy. Um, this same study looked at how people finance these expenditures, and the news is not good. They sold assets, which is Oh, this is so faint you can't really see it. But the sale of assets here in the uh, lowest 40% uh, going into debt, that's never a good thing. And then drawing down on savings. So none of the strategies that people have available to them to actually cover this expenditure are, are good for them longer term in terms of their productivity, the sustainability of the household, and their continued um, prosperity and moving up the uh, income ladder. Um, so that's a sort of a nutshell, quick version of the situation with regard to diabetes in India. I want to shift now to um, smoking in China. This is a really interesting problem because not only, it turns out smoking is addictive to people and also to governments. Tobacco is a major source of revenue for the Chinese government and it comes from both taxation and also from being the largest producer of, of uh, tobacco um, in the world. And it's a huge industry. Um, about 63% of Chinese men currently smoke and the number for women is about 7% and both numbers are actually rising, which is quite amazing if you think that two thirds of men uh, are currently smoking. This is much, much higher than we see in many of the Western countries. Um, and uh, there is almost no anti-tobacco activity. And I have to say that I, at least with current trends, I don't see, I'm not very encouraged that it's going to be uh, taken on by the government because the government has really mixed messages. And just by way of showing this, I found this uh, very interesting story. This was on uh, 
a PRI, a Public Radio International story, that the, um, ca the county of uh, Dongguan was encouraging smoking. So I'm going to switch here to play you a little, um, a little radio clip about this. This story about public health, authorities in one part of China aren't just saying thank you for smoking, they're ordering people to light up. And if you don't follow the order, you're going to be paying. You're either going to have your salary cut because your work unit's not going to get as much money, or you're going to be paying a fine for smoking the wrong kind of cigarettes. All right. There are a lot of questions to ask the world's Mary Kay Maxted. Where is the order coming down from at least the local government that tells local Chinese people you must smoke? This is a county called Gong'an in Hubei province in southern, southern central China. And basically, Gong'an County has decided that its tax revenue from cigarettes has been going down for way too long. So it's basically said now that every work unit, every factory, every office has to consume cigarettes. And they even have a quota for each office. It's about 400 cartons of cigarettes per office and about 120 cartons of cigarettes per school per year. Per school? So they're encouraging school kids to smoke? Well, they're encouraging schools as a whole to go through cigarettes. Now, whether this is teachers or whether it's high school students or whatever, they don't really specify. And not only are you required to smoke your quota of cigarettes, you have to be smoking the locally made cigarettes. In fact, this article that appeared in a local Hubei paper quoted a school teacher as saying that a couple of local officials came by and looked in his ashtray and in the trash cans, and they found three cigarette butts that were not a local brand. So they went to the school authorities and they said, this is against the regulations, we're going to have to fine you a thousand kwai. Now a thousand kwai is about $150. That's more than the average factory worker for sure makes in a month. And the school authorities said, please, we won't do it again. And they were like, well, OK, we'll let you off this time. But next time you have to be smoking. Local cigarettes, we're going to be coming by every month to make sure you do. And if you don't smoke enough of them, we're going to deduct from your budget the equivalent value of the cigarettes you should have been smoking. So they're doing this as a budgetary move, saying you have to smoke these locally made cigarettes in order for us to keep our budget up. How come the budget is down? I mean, are people there just naturally smoking less? It's not really clear from the article in the Hubei newspaper what's happening, although it is mentioned that locals have been smoking cigarettes from outside of the county and outside of the province. Um, a lot of these locally made cigarettes are pretty rough. A, a really good illustration of this, well, almost not attention, there's not much pulling, at least in this local situation, to discourage tobacco consumption and pretty strong encouragement to actually consume fairly high amounts uh, 150 cartons for a school when, you know, most of the people in that school are not smokers, we hope. Um, so that's, it's a pretty uh, a strong, um, strong encouragement. Um, this is that same thing. I didn't know whether the clip was going to play. So I like that they looked in the ashtrays and, and the cans to see what kind of cigarettes people were uh, smoking. One of the uh, common uh, effects of smoking is, is cardiovascular disease, and particularly stroke can be very devastating. And a study done in, uh, in China showed that the expenses, and again, these are out-of-pocket expenses for the most part. Um, some people have insurance, but n many, many don't. And that they were spending two, over $2,000 on medications for um, hospital for, for hospital and uh, medication costs, and they had out of pocket costs of two thousand dollars. So the majority of it was not covered, and um, this was catastrophic levels of expenditure for about seventy one percent of the population. Um, and so again, a huge burden on people who are really not well able to burden it, to to bear it. A different study, I'm going to switch just for a minute to Bangladesh because I found this a very interesting study. They looked at the, the impact of the expenses on smoking, on tobacco products, on poverty levels and found that the poorest, uh, smoke, the poorest households were the more likely to, to smoke. They were twice as likely to smoke as the wealthier ones. Um, and that the smokers were spending more than twice on tobacco, what they were spending on clothing, house, health, education, combined, combined. 
and that if the smoker could stop smoking and divert that amount of money to purchase of food, they could add 500 calories to the diet of a couple of kids in the household. Um, so they estimated that about 10 million people could have an adequate diet if the money were spent on food rather than on tobacco, and that this would save 350 children per day. Now that's a pretty remarkable uh, impact that we often, we don't think of it in these terms, and I really uh, liked this paper that was um, published in Tobacco Control a few years ago. Um, and I think it's really something we should bear in mind, and again, these are expenditures at household level. The government doesn't really feel it. It's not really pinching them. And so the, the money is kind of not going in the right pocket or coming out of the right pocket for the government to perceive the problem and really take some important measures. So just to conclude, we're seeing increasing rates of noncommunicable diseases around the world, particularly in Asia where the urbanization is rapid, the lifestyle changes are very, very rapid. Um, we're seeing type 2 diabetes. We're also seeing cardiovascular disease and COPD, uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, and uh, lung cancer, breast cancer, and other, other cancers are becoming more um, prevalent. And the burden on families is huge, and again, often leading not only to the uh, costs of care, but the premature death of the breadwinner and losses of income as that uh, uh, process plays out. Smoking is a particular cause of morbidity and mortality, which is preventable. A lot of the cancers we are not yet in a position to prevent, but the smoking-related ones we definitely could. But again, this we have to wean governments as well as people off of the addiction to tobacco. And some projections, I didn't include them in, the, in this talk just for um, time reasons, but the pro projected number of beds just to cope with the increasing healthcare needs is really pretty frightening as well. Um, the existing infrastructure is already taxed very heavily with the burden of uh, particularly um, smoking-related disease, and uh, the needs for new beds and more doctors and so on is just going to increase. So this is also going to be having an impact on economic growth by call, causing a growth of um, expenditure in the health, health setting and drawing people away and their investment away from other sectors. Thank you very much. So we will now uh, turn from the comparative perspective um, and drill down really to the municipal level. Uh, and we're quite fortunate to have Professor Madhu Kohler with us, who's a professor at the Metropolitan College here at Boston University. She will focus on Kolkata in India um, and really some of the more ingenious uh, strategies at the local level to cope with urbanization with a less resource uh, intensive uh, approach. So um, as Edward uh, said, I'm kind of going to go from uh, shifting gears. Not, don't hear me. Okay. I'm so used to speaking without the mic. I bet I could stand there and you could all hear me. But. Um, so uh, looking at sort of what Karen and Susan had to say at the national level, I think my talk would sort of provide a different perspective in sort of looking at the city level analysis. Because in a way, what it does is it kind of gives you finer grain data, not only to look at the specific context-based problems, but also to look at solutions which can uh, work at a local level. So. As somebody mentioned this morning, I think it was Adil, I think, he said that climate change is not a 21st century problem. And definitely, it's not a 21st century problem, but um, looking at sort of the environment, uh, the city and the environment, uh, we do have to look at climate change and sort of um, at that moment, sort of looking at the environment, the climate change becomes a 21st century problem. Um, as much as there is tremendous growth and development in urban Asia, environmental concerns are also becoming paramount. And these things, these environmental concerns threaten the very survival of, uh, of the people of urban Asia as well as in many parts of the world. And like uh, Susan just spoke, there's all different kinds of problems and certainly um, those that affect the survival of, of the people. Um, for some reason, 
Is it moving? Okay, great. So just to sort of put things in perspective, um, that's $100 billion. And um, looking at sort of uh, envirom uh, attacking environment and sort of looking at climate uh, adaptation, that's the amount of money that the World Bank estimates is going to be needed every single year till 2050 if you're going to arrest sort of uh, global climate change at two, per, two degrees Celsius rise. And just to put things in pers perspective, um, urban Asia or cities in urban Asia have very little resources to actually dedicate to climate change, if you will, or climate change adaptation. So for example, um, in New York City, post Sandy, the city uh, sort of grew more aware. There were great plans in place. There's a lot of resilience built because of the resources of the city. Whereas in uh, cities like Dhaka, Bangladesh, in Asia, uh, even after the 1998 floods, there are millions and millions of people who are sort of um, still reeling from the effects. And um, the disparity is obvious, and I'm going to make a small comparison to sort of uh, bring the point home. And on one hand, uh, you have New York City. The annual budget of New York City is about $70 billion, whereas the entire budget of the country of Bangladesh is about $150 billion. And uh, this is just sort of uh, to drive the point home that resource constraints are a big deal, and to actually look at um, environmental issues and address them and to adapt to climate, uh, resources are something that are severely lacking in this uh, place. So my talk actually draws from a larger research project which uh, sort of I did over two years um, during my last years at MIT. And I looked at many um, global, many cities of South Asia, particularly mega cities, to see what could be done really to address climate, um, and especially given the fact that uh, these cities were severely resource constrained. So before we look at sort of the city level data and the particular case that I want to talk about, which is Kolkata in India, um, it's important to sort of take a look at the landscape of the mega cities of the world, just to get a sense of not only the hotspots where urbanization is happening, but also the places where uh, these things, uh, where environment is sort of being threatened, if you will. And of these mega cities, there's a large number of cities here which are in uh, South Asia and also in Asia right there. So it goes to, from sort of this analysis, one can figure out that there's over 2 billion people, city dwellers in Asia, that are facing escalating risks from uh, climate change. And these risks are not only environmental, but they're also uh, societal as well as economic, if you will. And of course, I'm not going to go into detail, but um, some of these risks are from sea level rise, from saltwater intrusion, um, from floods, cyclones, and of course, the increased frequency of bad weather, if you will. Um, We've again spoken about this. It kind of feels, you know, it's sometimes great to go last and sometimes it's not. So you might see a lot of repetition here. But um, of course, there's the things that some of these cities face is the rapid rate of urbanization, the weak institutional capacities, which um, we already spoke about, the issue of governance. And um, sort of more importantly, the piece that I'm going to look at is how can cities in um, urban Asia um, actually sort of adapt to climate change or address environmental issues in the face of resource constraints? So one of the biggest problems that these cities are going to face is in the water sector. And um, really, the sort of addressing issues of the water sector is probably one of the most immediate problems that uh, we are going to be faced with because there's going to be large, a large number of these cities, about 
uh, 2.5 billion people are going to be in water stressed conditions and then there's going to be about 1.8 who are going to live in absolute water scarcity uh, by the year 2025. So in a sense, the bottom line is that almost 60% of the world's population will now be affected by climate change. All, these, uh, all the people who are living in urban Asia are actually going to sort of face very acute problems, the most of them being in, in the water sector, as I mentioned. And so this underscores the idea that one has to find some very immediate solutions and you can't wait for um, you know, the silver bullet that somehow you're going to come up with the perfect plan and you're going to solve all these problems. So sort of looking at this context, if you will, um, there's a meta question that drives this research. And so, um, you know, it, the question being that in the face of existing resource constraints, what planning strategies would be most effective in uh, cities like this? So before I talk about the findings, I wanted to very quickly sort of touch base and um, introduce you to some of these cases. And those of you who work in Asia and those of you who work in uh, mega coastal cities in Asia and particularly related to climate change would be familiar with the cities of Kolkata and Dhaka. And so Kolkata and Dhaka are sort of in this Indo-Gangetic region, and it's a very fertile sort of deltaic region, which uh, was one of the most um, fertile regions of the world where um, uh, paddy as well as cotton and jute and so on, there was a huge surplus of it and uh, it was exported um, sort of all over the world. But with climate change or in, you know degradation of the environment, however you want to spin it, uh, this fragile ecosystem, which once was incredibly productive, has now sort of uh, become a place where uh, the salt water, because of climate change, the salt water has sort of uh, crept in and, and the tides have changed, so the fresh water actually doesn't come back. So in a sense, what used to be very, very productive land has now uh, been has salt water intrusion and there's no longer that kind of productivity present. So that brings the question about uh, climate migration. So there's a lot of farmers in this region who are migrating to the big cities. Um, again, I'm not going to go into the detail of the impacts, but what I do want to talk about very quickly is um, this idea that particularly in the cities of urban Asia, there's a few things happening almost all the time and things that need to be addressed immediately at the city level. And one of them is that because of climate change or uh, however it is the change of the weather patterns, the, uh, the extreme events are becoming uh, much more intense and they're becoming much more frequent. So for example, um, we used to, in India, we used to have monsoons once a year from, I wanna say, late July to late August or perhaps early September. And now uh, cities which were dealt to, which were equipped to deal with sort of the water, uh, the, le the load of storm water that was coming in, now no longer can do so with their existing infrastructure. And the reason is because now uh, what used to be monsoons once a year happens two or three or four times in, in the entire year. And uh, cities get flooded and there's no way for the water to um, actually drain away because that's another problem with urbanization is that all the development actually uh, takes away the capacity of, of the surface of the city or, uh, to uh, have the water sort of drain in. So, uh, so in a sense, what's happening is there's a lot of surface runoff, and when there is no place for the water to go, these cities are completely getting flooded. And at the same time, there's this whole other um, uh, situation where in most of the cities in Asia, 
there's this combined storm sewer water system. So when uh, the, the storm water drains sort of flood, so does the sewer systems. And so all the water that actually comes out is no longer this rainwater which you could wade through. It actually brings um, the, you know, all the sewer water to the surface and then there's a whole load of other things uh, to deal with health and communicable diseases, waterborne diseases and so on. Um, so within sort of this larger question is this nested research question. And um, more importantly, I, I think the more practical question here is that in um, cities where there are resource constraints, especially in uh, Asia, where most of the national budget or the city budget is being channeled towards um, you know, taking care of shelter, access to water, sanitation, and so on, why the hell would anybody in their right mind actually want to take uh, all this, uh, the resources which are allocated for these basic necessities and try to divert them to adapt to climate change? Because, um, you know, when you're sort of fighting for food and you're looking for portable water, then uh, flooding and sort of wading through to get to work isn't really that big a deal. But, you know, as, as sort of in the people who are the planners and the environmentalists and so on, they're the ones who sort of have the awareness that something needs to be done. And, but, but as much as the awareness is there, the resources to do so is not always present. Um, So then the task at hand becomes, uh, the task at hand uh, for my research was to actually find opportunities in, in these cities where actually one could address climate change or adapt to climate change without having to uh, put in a whole lot of additional resources. So how does one do that? Um, I looked at about, I want to say, 10 or 12 cases, which I was extremely hopeful about. But today, I just wanted to share with you one of the most innovative cases I have come across sort of during my entire research. And that was um, in Kolkata. And it was sort of this way that the wetland systems of Kolkata were not only preserved, but at the same time, uh, they were used in so many different ways to circumvent so many of these problems. So just to give you a brief background, um, the wetlands of Kolkata, there's, uh, you know, huge, almost, it's one of the largest wetland systems, and um, it encompasses about 12,500 hectares. So just to give you an idea, one hectare is a little more than two football fields, so it's a huge, huge uh, space. And wetlands, for those of you who don't know, is, you know, it could be marshlands, it could be swamplands, it could be water bodies, but it's sort of a whole big system that comes together to uh, create a um, sort of uh, ecosystem uh, within, within the city. Um, the reason why I looked at wetlands is because this is not, the wetlands is not only unique to Kolkata in India, but there are many, many South Asian um, mega cities that actually have a lot of wetlands. And just to give you an idea, Dhaka in Bangladesh, which is in the same uh, deltaic region, um, at one point it used to have about 52% of the city used to be wetlands. So if you're able to preserve the wetlands, then perhaps, perhaps, there just might be a model which we can translate where we use the wetlands to, to adapt to climate change and address issues of, of the environment of these cities. Um, so, okay, great. So just, I'm gonna sort of go off script and you guys can read this, but there's no way that one can really explain it unless you have a video and somebody's talking through it. But um, imagine these vast areas of wetlands and there's this city and it, this is right next to the city of Kolkata which is rapidly urbanizing and pieces of it are being developed almost overnight. So there's almost nothing left but then the city officials um, sort of through global pressure as well as sort of local pressure decide that they want to save these wetlands. And so the planners of the city get together and uh, one of the mandates of, of this project was that 
you needed to preserve the wetlands. But, but in a sense, they came up with some incredible ideas because uh, these, uh, because there were a lot of other projects sort of um, in in the making, such as they needed to. Um, create new infrastructure, new treatment plants to actually treat the sewage before it goes into um, the river, or and then there was these drainage systems that they needed to lay down and so on. So what they did was that they created, they sort of preserved the wetlands and created zones within the wetlands. So in a sense, it did many, many things all at once. First, um, there was, a, they realized that these wetlands would actually take in all the storm water and things like that when there were intense rainfall. So in a way, using these wetlands as drainage systems obviated the need for this extra infrastructure, uh, which further meant that uh, you know the resources that would have been otherwise allocated to um, sort of this kind of infrastructure now could be used elsewhere. The other thing that happened was that once this uh, drained water sort of entered these wetland systems, it went through sort of a, a series of iterations as they went through different sort of uh, gravel beds and so on, and I could get into the technical details, but you know, we'll save that for another time. But um, essentially what it did was that the pH value of the water sort of started to change, and as the w drained water went through, it got further and further purified. So which actually meant that you didn't have to have uh, water treatment plants anymore, or at least not as many. And then last but not the least, when sort of this water was sufficiently purified, uh, the local fishermen, who were not fishermen at one point, uh, they realized, they were used to be farmers, they realized that they could actually use some of these water bodies or these retention ponds and uh, fish farming became sort of a big thing in the city of Kolkata because before the fish used to be um, sort of caught in the rivers but now the rivers were so polluted and also the fish population had gone down so much that there was no way that um, uh, they had the same kind of supply. So then this, uh, these uh, wetlands started to be used as sort of the retention ponds of the wetlands started to be used as sort of uh, fish farms. And last but not the least, uh, after a sort of um, uh, the last iteration of having some kind of uh, fish farms and so on, the water then was used to irrigate uh, the, farms, uh, the farms nearby. And Kolkata became one of those cities where um, locally sourced food became very, very inexpensive. And there was tons and tons of produce being uh, generated because of the way these wetlands were being maintained. So in a sense, the wetlands produce approximately now about 13,000 tons of fish and 150 tons of uh, vegetables per day. So it, in a way, um, this problem is not only about adapting to the environment, about adapting to climate change, but, but in a way it sort of goes beyond that because it takes into account this innovation, takes into account sort of the economic and the social implications of, of the way cities are run. Um, so there's, I'm way over time, aren't I? Oh dear God, okay, um, let me see. So I'm going to actually jump a couple of things and just talk about sort of what this means, what the implications are for policy and practice. And the first thing is, the one thing I realized is that when you start to couple, um, uh, you know, infrastructure um, and, and, you, and uh, issues of climate change altogether, then the likelihood of uh, these projects being implemented, funded, and prioritized becomes much higher. And also, uh, it's extremely, and also the resources that are then allocated to infrastructure can also simultaneously be used for uh, climate change adaptation or address issues of, of the environment. Um, I'm gonna skip this one. So just to sort of uh, tie this all back together, my research suggests that there might be ways within sort of the existing planning developmental agenda, if you will, where climate change 
could be integrated into typical infrastructure projects. And this idea is not new because the idea of um, you know, adaptation as development is something that has been floated in the literature for quite some time. But there has never been any sort of focused understanding of how planners at a local level could actually make this happen. So um, this kind of approach I term as contingent adaptation. And I'm not going to read it, but uh, this sort of this idea that you want to have something in place which could work efficiently without the need for major sort of resource allocation, if you will. Uh, so. Two big takeaways, I love takeaways, and I love the fact that uh, Karen actually spoke of them. First is that um, in urban Asia, we are planning for a moving target, especially when it comes to climate change, because you don't really know how, how high the storm surge is going to be or how much rain is going to fall on any given day. So in this messy context, it becomes even uh, messier when um, you know, uh, there's issues of institutional capacity, there's issues of resource constraints, where there's this rapid rate of urbanization. So the idea is that your plans could be perhaps perfect, but they're not going to work, and it's extremely important to have a contingent plan or a plan that actually is easy to implement, if you will. And last thing is that you know, we look to experts, we look to sort of literature, we look to so many other things, and you know, I, I do the same. But sometimes, perhaps, the answers to some of the most pressing problems can be answered by sort of going back to the city and looking for answers. And that's what I found in sort of Kolkata, India. So thank you. So we still have uh, about 15, 20 minutes for questions and answers. And uh, given on that optimistic note, I open the floor to uh, participants. Uh, so I want to come back to, to Susie's talk. Uh, you know, to the extent that, that some of these um, uh, health risks and financial risks that are, that are generated by, uh, by bad outcomes are actually tied to different ways of, of cities financing their own growth, how do we, how do we break that chain? That's a, that's a really pernicious cycle. And, and so are there, are there ways that we can think of to actually sort of break that cycle uh, at its at its root. I think actually that's a question for the government people. Where's Graham? Isn't this a problem for him? Where is he? Oh, there he is, right mm -hmm. there in the middle. I think that um, part of the problem. I think I always I kind of term it the two pocket effect. That the pocket that's paying is to some extent the health sector. And typically, the health ministry is a lower level ministry, lower priority, lower prestige, and so on, compared to finance, certainly. And often, the uh, so they're not in a strong position to argue for, you know, yes, why don't you give up 8% of your revenue? That's a large amount of money to, to, to replace. And I hadn't really realized until I focused on this little anecdote from this Hubei province that it's not just the central government, it's the local government. On the other hand, the local government is probably where a lot of the good activities could be placed. I think a lot of what drove smoking um, rates down here in the US, and to some extent in Europe too, was uh, local ordinances of you know not smoking in bars and restaurants. Um, not smoking within umpteen feet of, of uh, entrance of a building or of a school and so on. Not selling cigarettes within, you know, I don't know how many hundred feet of school entrances and so on. Those are local ordinances. Those were not central government planned. So if we focus on local and, you know, maybe county level government, depending on the, the setting, things might be able to be done there. Um, although they are going to have to, you can see by the fines that they were trying to implement for these people not smoking enough of the right kind of cigarettes, that they're, they're going to be 
they're not going to move unless some way is found to replace that revenue. And that could be done perhaps by raising other revenues. It may well be, for example, that as vehicle ownership goes up, taxation of vehicle ownership could partially replace the cigarette. I don't know. I mean, this is probably a question for the municipal finance uh, people. But um, so maybe there's some, some ideas in there. If you could drastically increase taxation, then you can drive down Yeah. Yeah. I mean for taxation for, for cigarettes or yeah. And People are gonna drive I yeah, go ahead. Also that in budget terms there must be well first of all in health terms there must be interaction between smoking and pollution. Uh, yeah. So they must be looking at potentially catastrophic really bad. Costs. Yeah. Sorry. There's one in the back, question in the back. Um, I guess continuing on with this whole talk about cigarettes and everything, um, I kind of got fed up with kind of the cigarettes and everything while I was over in China as well. So I was doing mm. some research and talking to friends and everything. And granted, it was just coming from communications with friends and everything, so I'm sure it can't really be seen as indicative. But t those conversations, there was kind of this perception that, yes, there are the cigarettes and everything, but kind of this whole lung cancer thing, that's like a, that's a European problem. That's a Western problem. We don't get lung cancer. It's impossible mm -hmm. for us to get lung cancer, um, which I just thought was almost baffling. It's wrong. <laughs> <laughs> um, didn't yeah. know if there's any thought on kind of how there seems to be this perception that it's, since We're there's so much more lung cancer over here, over since here. of the historical thing, that it's kind of, well, we must not get it. So, so your friends really, for the most part, weren't aware of that smoking was bad for them generally, or did they just think, what, how would you characterize their level of knowledge? I guess there seemed to be the perception that kind of it's not good for you in just a general sense, that it makes you smell bad, it, it's kind of it's gross, but kind of the more actual health problems of lung cancer and stuff are more of a Western Some issue. other problem, <laughs> yeah. Interesting. A lot of work to be done. But the problem is the ones who would do that work don't have the incentive. The incentive goes the wrong way, and that's, that's, a, that's a big challenge. Deep deep. Uh, this question is for Karen. Uh, Karen. Thank you. Uh, this question is for Karen. Um, Karen, you've done some such amazing research on you know, both India and China. And I'm wondering if you've had an opportunity to speak to, say, the government officials in India, because you know, urbanization is now sort of following what happened in China, and maybe there are a lot of lessons to be learned from there. Um, and if not, uh, is it because they don't want to hear the story, or you just haven't had an opportunity to, to present your findings to them? So uh, I've been fortunate because I've had a number of opportunities to, to speak with government officials. Um, last year, or maybe it was two years ago, there was an official Yale event in India, pretty high level uh, discussion um, among um, Yale administrators and, and our deans. We actually had the dean of uh, the School of Forestry and Environmental Studies, the, uh, the dean of the School of Architecture um, uh, in, in, this, in this meeting. And, one of, one of the things that I'm asked pretty regularly by officials in India is they want to know my opinion about which strategy is better, uh, what's happening in India is so different from what's happening in China. Um, I th one of the panelists mentioned this, and I can't remember who, the issue of financial constraints and uh, governance, and, I, and this is not my area of research, so I'm gonna have to turn to other people who know this more than I do, but that's something that I think needs to have a lot more attention in, in both cases, is the, the role of financial constraints and decision-making in creating bottlenecks for infrastructure development. That's very clearly a big issue that is a recurring issue in, in India. Um, I'd been going back to Bangalore pretty regularly um, over many years, and the same road was still being developed, right? You know, you go to China two weeks later and the bridge is done. Um, it's, you know, very different. Part of it is financing, right? The financing mechanism. Part of it is governance. Um, the other part of it is um, 
the way in which it goes back to land and who owns the land. Um, many, many years ago when I was still at Stanford, we had uh, Sabir Bhatia come, um, who some of you might know him as the founder of Hotmail, remember that? Uh, you know, he sold Hotmail, made a lot of money, and he was very interested in developing a eco-city. And uh, he was very sincere about it. You know, I remember he came uh, to Stanford with uh, uh, a big group, uh, a big you know, bag of books um, uh, and case studies of, of uh, urban development. Uh, so he was a student of Shandagar and uh, you know, a, a number of planners. And uh, he was really sincere about this. And one of the things that held up his project ultimately was the issue of land and being able to, to get land. Um, but, you know, I, I don't know if that's the appropriate question about whether Ch India can be learning from China because they, the, the mechanisms are so different. Um, I, I, in my mind, I have this image of, a, of a, the, the tortoise and the hare that, you know, in China everything's happening so quickly at lightning speed that, again, for many years I would go back to my same study site and I'd go to my, what used to be my favorite restaurant, it was torn down and a new restaurant, new, new development, whereas in, China, in India things are just happening much more slowly. Um, there's a lot more concern about inclusivity in India and about equality and about informality, and I think that's another aspect of this that's very different between China and India. There's not a lot of informality in China, but there's informality is really driving a lot of the urban development in India. Um, so I don't know if that completely answers your, your question. It's something that's come up many times um, in, um, in both formal and very informal discussions. I, I do want to share one story that I think is, is interesting. Um, Last year, I taught a class, or two years ago, I'm getting all my years wrong now, but some time ago, I taught a class at Yale called Urbanization in China and India. And if there's something that I could suggest the BU initiative to do is something like that, is to take students to China and India. Uh, I took them to India for a week and China for a week, and it completely blew their mind because everything that you know, we'd been reading a lot of material, I'd been giving lectures, but there's nothing like meeting with a minister at his house for lunch. And the story that I want to tell is that the students ask the ministers the hardest questions that I normally would not be asking. And I think because the minister, we were at his house having lunch, and the, because the minister was talking to students, was much franker about um, answering uh, very bluntly. And I think that Part of the reason why I'm telling the story is I think we need to have more of those types of discussions and dialogues about what's happening in this place, what works here, what doesn't work there. One of the big things that the students came away from with from that trip was um, in, a, in the U.S., you know, so these were 15 Yale undergrads, they said that in a U.S. context, they had heard so much about the authoritarian government in China and that they thought that everything in China would be bad. And you know what we hear what they heard a lot about India was that it's a democracy and that you know their experience with democracy is, democracy is the American experience. And that what they saw in India was not their image of democracy and what they saw in China was not their image of an authoritarian state. Mm -hmm. And that just raised a number of questions and very interesting discussions about um, inclusive and equitable urbanization, sustainability. Um, anyway, um, that, that I think is a, a other uh, area that I think we should be going as educators and researchers. In the back. Thank you. My name is Lani Stevens. I'm a Humphrey Fellow. My question goes to Susan. Thank you very much for that wonderful presentation. I'm still uh, under shock <laughs> because of the revelations from the data you supplied. I want to ask, from all this research and experience, do you suspect that there could likely be any kind of political manipulation beyond the economic gains in this region. The reason I ask that is if smoking cigarette 
is a threat to human life and existence and also the climate change that we're talking about. Why would a government deliberately support and sponsor mm -hmm. her own people? Mm -hmm. If we cast our mind back a little, I'm an African mm -hmm. from Nigeria. But in South Africa, the stories were heard and the things we saw was that the white government, this is a reference anyway, yeah. made available drinking joints, beer parlors, drinking booths in Soweto and uh, the low-income communities so that the people could drink themselves into bankruptcy and wretchedness and stupidity, mm -hmm. making available the things that could probably destroy their lives economically and socially and culturally. Could there be any kind of internal or external manipulation no. as against the economic gains that mm -hmm. these leaders and politicians are going to derive from getting their people uh, mm -hmm. to get into cigarette smoking. Yeah. Thank you. Well, thank you for your question. It's a very interesting one. And I think the issue is which, which goals does a government want to maximize? And I think getting a lot of people out of poverty has been the goal of the Chinese government, pretty much. And that involves all the employment. I think something like 10 million people are involved in the, directly involved in the tobacco industry one way or the other. I'm not sure that that even includes the farmers who sell tobacco, who raise it and sell it. Um, and to be fair to governments, um, this whole non-communicable diseases issue is fairly recent. Um, we only learned about the real dangers of cigarettes, I guess it was the Surgeon General's report which came out in the 60s. Um, I'm, I'm a child, of, I'm an actually a smoking orphan. Both my parents died of smoking related diseases. And they were smokers when, at a time when ads featured doctors who preferred this brand over that. And um, so the knowledge has only come to the Western world fairly recently. And even until the last 15 or so years, it was hotly contested by the industry. Mm -hmm. And they would have their own expert panels who would de deny that statistics are all wrong, your experts are all fools, and so on. So I'm not that surprised that a government which has been through a lot of turmoil, if you think back over the Chinese, the history of China, the last, say, 40 or 50 years, it's not been just a single smooth ride. It's been very up and down. And so I'm not that surprised that this isn't the top priority of the government. Now, having said that, now is the time that they need to start paying attention to this other thing. And I, I think, actually, there may be a slight opportunity coming in because the air pollution issue has gained uh, a lot of attention. And people, I hear anecdotally from my main news source, which is National Public Radio, that people are moving, people are leaving, even coming here to the States if they have the wherewithal to get away from the pollution in Beijing and so on. So that whole issue of sort of indoor and outdoor air quality, I think, is going to start really getting more attention. And I think with the overall air pollution issue, it's, it's possible, I don't know if it's likely, but it's possible that the smoking issue may also come into it. You'll have a lot of pushback from not only the Chinese tobacco industry, but there's now a lot of international tobacco presence. So it's not going to be an easy road, but taking a, a sort of a optimistic view. Here in the US, it went pretty quickly. Once some measures were put in place, um, it's become you know, really hard to find a place to smoke mm -hmm. in, in Boston. Where can you go to smoke that's not your own home? And even a lot of housing places now don't allow you even to smoke in your own home. So once you reduce the footprint of where you can actually light up a cigarette, it makes, you know, makes it a lot easier for people to quit because they just can't find a place to do it. So 
And I would just say one thing about the South Africa experience. It was very interesting because the South Africa tobacco industry was Afrikaner owned. And it wasn't until the change of government in Nelson Mandela that they were able to rein in the tobacco industry, the Rembrandt and the others, to actually um, make their own anti-smoking, anti anti-tobacco measures. Um, and they've been quite successful. But under the former government, under the Afrikaner government, it wasn't going to happen because the economic interests were too powerful. And one final question here. <clears throat> Madhu, I want to go back to the first session and the perception of tension between Bish and Annette. Yes. You might want to continue that. But uh, could you speak briefly about um, the, how that, that wetlands project got put into place, where the funding was from? Obviously, that's not something that comes from sort of street level um, uh, sure organic urbanism, that's a major project. Where the money came from, how long it took to develop that, what the interest was in developing that. The payoff is, seems pretty clear from your description of the vegetables and the fish that come out of that system, but uh, how did that whole system get put in place? So uh, what happened was that, uh, can you hear me? Is this even on? Yeah, okay. Um, so what happened was that, um, you know, there were a whole lot of, um, interest groups, uh, especially sort of uh, primarily comprised of environmental activists in the city itself. And uh, what was happening was that most of Kolkata, which had a lot of uh, wetlands, had been sort of developed and there were high rises coming on. And this particular stretch of wetlands, which was towards the, e towards the east of the city, was the last um, wetland standing, if you will. And so what they did was that they went and uh, wrote to um, you know, a couple of big leaders all over the world. And then the, I don't know if you're aware of the Ramasar Convention, but the Ramasar Convention is kind of this uh, international body, if you will, neutral body, which um, identifies sites which are to be preserved. And they're both sort of man-made as well as natural sites. And in a sense, what uh, the Ramas, they kind of lobbied to have the site be designated as sort of a Ramasar preservation site, if you will. But that had no money associated with it at all. And so once that happened, the visibility of the project sort of shot to the roof. And uh, because of political reasons, the, uh, the local government or the local politicians decided that they weren't going to sort of uh, let the developers underhandedly develop parts of it and then eventually to, you know, urbanize the whole area. And, and, so, and then at the same time, there was all this other infra money coming in from the ADB, from sort of the local government, the state government, and so on, which had all these range of infrastructural projects that needed to be done. And so, you know, so it kind of came to a head that sort of the preservation of the wetlands and these projects were, you know, were all sort of under the purview of the municipal government. And that's when uh, they consulted with, you know, these local environmental activists and so on, and realized, hey, if we preserve this in a certain way, then we can get so many different things done without having to have additional resources. So in a way, it was a happy accident because you know, this is where sort of uh, politics, economics, environment, you know, all of them sort of actually um, play together, which almost never happens. But I think the bigger um, takeaway from this is that there's a lot more cities out there, coastal megacities, which have these wetlands. And, you know, I, I could go into sort of the economic savings on sort of not having to build all these things. but. But what it is, more importantly, is that there could be a model here somewhere of being able to take this idea of wetlands and do much more than just preserve and use it as some kind of infrastructure to adapt to climate change. So I hope that answers the question. Great. Well, two uh, final po points of order. One, please join me in thanking uh, our speakers and take, for them for taking the time today. Thank you.
I think that that, that uh, this last discussion did offer uh, quite, uh, despite some of the pessimism that I went into it with, I think quite optimistic scenarios actually moving forward on the local level, which I think we can discuss uh, into the reception. Uh, second point is that now Professor Tony Genados, who is director uh, of the Party Center and one of the co-sponsors and main organizers of this event, has the unenviable task of bringing all of this together. So the entire day's multiple discussions, he's going to draw a thread through them. Um, he's also in an unenviable position because he's going to stand between us and the uh, food and beverage reception. That, that it'll be at four o'clock. So in, in two ways, uh, he's, he's challenged, but we have our fearless leader, Tony Genados. Edward, thank you. Um, I think actually you meant to say this is the enviable. This, you, you don't, you don't, I drew the short straw somewhere. Um, so what I actually want to do is refer back to all the panels and, uh, and, uh, and, and find a way to try to stimulate some discussion, partially draw a thread through what we've, uh, what we've talked about and discussed during the day. Um, but to do that, I want to offer first a few thoughts that are based on some of the presentations and discussions throughout the day and use these really as a jumping off point uh, for more discussion and for questions. And I'll be very disappointed if at the end of these several slides um, I'm the only one who has anything left to say because I really want, I really do want to try to stimulate um, interaction. And then what I'll try to do is moderate that discussion and steer your questions to the people who can actually uh, address them. Uh, but I also hope that you'll bring up uh, new points to draw on some of the interactions and, and uh, ideas uh, that we've had throughout the day. So let me start with a few observations um, and questions that seem to me to emanate uh, from these panels. Uh, one is that um, cities in Asia are not blank slates. We're, we are not now in the business um, that perhaps we were in in the 50s and early 60s of creating in a sense, newly planned cities on a blank landscape. Instead, what we're doing um, is building on urban landscapes that are already exist. Um, and in some places, um, in particular, perhaps in China, we're going through the second, the third, maybe even the fourth generation um, of rebuilding. Uh, and that those places are shaped by human needs, and the, but in fact need both the kinds of large infrastructure that we associate with urban landscapes um, but attention to, uh, as well, to meeting the basic needs of a very large fraction of poor people um, in those cities. Secondly, that we, we shouldn't be pretending that, that this flow of immigration into the cities, once started, is going to stop. Uh, there's no evidence that, that there will actually be a, a hiatus or a secession. Um, even though the, the actual drivers of urbanization differ from place to place, um, but we have to deal with what's there. And in a sense, what, we, what it seems that we're doing is reconstructing the rights to space to live uh, and work on the fly as these cities expand incredibly rapidly. Uh, and, and then asking this question that, that we asked at the end of the very first panel. Um, for these, this rapidly expanding set of urban landscapes of cities um, have created for themselves and for their populations a whole series of very, very challenging problems in governance, self-governance. Uh, and it, but at the same time, for some issues, like mitigating greenhouse gas emissions, um, there is a very large population of people who are looking to cities as part of a solution set. Uh, and is this really realistic, that we can, we, that we can expect uh, cities that are, are trying to meet their own serious challenges of governance and essentially reinventing themselves on the fly to also serve as, the end, as levers for change um, on large environmental and social issues? Secondly, I was really struck uh, in part because I never expected this to happen. Uh, in the second panel on, the, on this underlying theme of land and access to land uh, as, a, as a major force, as a major feature um, of urbanization in cities uh, throughout 
uh, throughout Asia. And then on the one hand, in a sense, strengthening the hand and the power of economic and political elites and often exacerbating conflict, and which raised a whole host of, of, of really, I thought, fascinating questions. Um, whether NGOs can actually play an effective role in sort of bridging this co communications gaps and power gaps between uh, more centralized government institutions and neighborhoods, um, and especially, uh, especially the poor. Um, the importance of intermediaries, uh, and I guess one of the things that we learned, that I learned for sure, is that in many parts of the world, in different languages, there's always a word uh, that, that is uh, a name for, for these people um, who, in a sense, provide a set of services that actually determine how the city works and how it delivers services, how it bridges this gap between policy and, and actions on the actions on the ground and, and whose activities actually begin to integrate different populations within a city um, into, an, into a, a more complete urban experience. Um, and then this question of balance between government as an agent of governing, as an agent of wealth creation, that is the, the role that government sees itself playing, um, and as an agent of contracting out the more mundane aspects of governance. And then finally, uh, the, the, the realization that the rate and scale uh, of urbanization in Asia, in Asia is fundamentally different than anything we've seen before. So everybody, I think, has their favorite statistic that's emerged out of, uh, out of this. Um, mine actually comes from a slide that Annette showed um, early in the morning, uh, the outline of Beijing, uh, with a population of 23 million people. Uh, I, I think was on the slide. So for purposes of comparison, that is the population of Australia. Right? It's two-thirds the population of Canada. Right? So these are, these are objects of governance that, whose scale is, for a Western experience, almost unimaginable. Imagine the population of Australia in one place and trying to, that has grown rapidly with a tremendous amount of, of growth with an underground, literally, subterranean population of over a million um, and trying to govern that, and trying to govern that place. This is a, this is a fundamentally different problem um, than, than is faced in almost, uh, almost anywhere else in the world. But the drivers and consequences of, of those changes, these sort of bulk statistics are, are fascinating but the actual drivers of change can be quite different from place to place, whether they're demographic drivers or, or economic drivers. Uh, and, and that also raises this, this question as to who, who are actually the actors. And so we, we talked a lot today about the importance of the actors in place and who benefits from, uh, uh, from land, what is essentially a series of urban land grabs, um, who, who, who doesn't benefit from that. Uh, and we didn't spend a lot of time talking about the importance of non-local actors, except to recognize that they are important, uh, as, well as, uh, as well as local actors. Uh, we can recognize that urbanization affects not only the populations in the cities themselves, uh, but also affects their neighbors. And, and in some cases, to the extent that we're, they're actually drivers of global environmental change, um, change in the physical climate system, a loss of agricultural land in many places, perhaps with negative feedbacks for the cities themselves. So not just negative feedbacks for, in a sense, uh, a region or in some extreme cases even the rest of the world, but negative consequences for themselves and for their own uh, longer term sustainability. Um, and then this extraordinary set of stories about lifestyle changes associated with urbanization, um, associated with increased health risks. Uh, and, and dramatic changes not only in health costs, but who bears those costs. So the difference between those costs being borne uh, by individual households um, as opposed to government expenditures, I think, is, a, is, is, is perhaps worth uh, uh, exploring in more, in more depth. Uh, and then finally, this question of, of what does, will it actually take to sustain urban resilience? Um, how do we find strategies uh, that, that enable adaptation to change, uh, to change in climate, to change in sea level, um, and that increase resilience in the face of increasing environmental stress. And in a sense, what we heard, I think, in the story about 
uh, about Calcutta and, and, and this, this uh, use of wetlands as a, as a, in a sense of providing the kinds of services that ecosystems can, uh, can provide to help with managing water and managing flood risk is, in a sense, the reverse process of cities gobbling up agricultural land. Instead, what we have is, is an example, I think, of a city being reintegrated um, with, its, with a natural landscape uh, and region around it that actually enhances uh, resilience and, and hopefully, I think, over the longer term enhances the sustainability of that urban landscape um, in the face, in, in this case, of stresses in the water sector. An unanswered question, something that Edward raised for this last, last panel, um, is do environmental issues that are associated um, with increased urbanization and with cities' expansion, both in terms of sheer numbers, in terms of density, um, in terms of their infrastructure, actually become a focus for social change? Uh, and so that, does that actually provide an additional impetus uh, for changes in governance, for changes in, in the economics, for changes in the political uh, structures and institutions um, that fuel cities. So I would like now to, um, uh, to ask, uh, open, this, open this up to all of you, um, those of you who've had the stamina to stay all day, for which I congratulate you, uh, the, for questions for the panels and presenters. Um, or for other observations of themes that, from the conference as a whole that you think are particularly important um, that, that we haven't managed to surface yet. Um, and, and then um, uh, after such discussion, we'll, we'll close with a few final thoughts. I am painfully aware that I'm the last, uh, this is the last uh, part of the conference standing between, literally in this case, standing between you and the reception uh, so uh, with that, let me, just, let me just open this up to the floor uh, for, uh, for additional questions, observations, um, thoughts that you'd like to share, uh, or questions you'd like to direct at panelists. Hi, this is Beverly Brown, and I'm involved with the Center for Global Health and Development. Um, and my question is really, I'm not sure it's who it's for specifically, but it's around the issue of all of these kinds of interventions require funding. And I was struck, Tony, when you talked about the fact that, um, the, of the importance of land. And it, it, what came to my mind is what resources do cities really have for which they can get revenue? And, and land becomes one of those. Are there other resources? Is there anybody, any academic institution or whomever really working on other resources? Like, uh, for example, I know Procter & Gamble is working on uh, sustainability in the sense of using their waste streams to become revenue centers, not, not actually cost centers. So obviously, waste is a huge issue in cities. How do we work with them? How do, how do we provide the technologies, whatever it takes, to convert other kinds of cost centers right now, or, or if they're not dealing with waste, you know, the, the challenges and, of the illness and so forth that raises, how do we help them see other sources of revenue that then they can use to uh, enact the, the, the right priorities that will make the cities more resilient, will deal with some of the health issues? Second part of it is how do we engage the private sector more? I, and one thing I think doesn't happen, and the political issue is, is very real in China versus India, but how do we engage the private sector uh, as well to get more involved with, with these kinds of initiatives and providing some of the, the funding in the form of public-private partnerships and the things like that? Great question. It sounds to me like uh, maybe in, in the first couple of panels we might have people who are uh, might perhaps be able to address some of some of these issues, or not? Here, wait. We, we've got a. There's a mic. As I discussed in uh, in my uh, uh, talk, I think land is an important source of revenue. Uh, I think the question is, um, you know, who actually controls the, the development process of land? What are the externalities, and how do those get priced into that whole process, and who ends up benefiting? So 
Um, so I, I do think land is important, an important uh, source of revenue. Other sources of revenue, it's a difficult question because I think it's a very political question. So one that uh, example that popped to mind was the example of Singapore, which has the Central Provident Fund, which is essentially this one-third tax on, um, well, the tax is actually taken from uh, corporate employers, but it's actually, well, no, I'm sorry, it's taken out of people's wages, but it's essentially a tax on people and on, on companies. Uh, but it's a very difficult thing for governments to do, to, to suppress people's wages and to take uh, a chunk of what would be corporate pro profits. So that's a, one thought. It's just making difficult political choices about things like taxation. But another thing, that thought, a, a comment that I was going to make was about one topic that we didn't discuss at great length, which is cars and their impact on urban form and on this, the sprawling of urban form. Cities are growing very rapidly in terms of population, but they're growing more rapidly in terms of space. They're gobbling up space much more quickly because of what you could call a process of a suburbanization. So one of the thoughts, that, another thought that popped to mind was taxing cars, which is something that, again, Singapore has done uh, very effectively, both to generate a source of revenue, because no matter how high they raise the taxes, 100%, 200%, people still buy cars, but also to control this generator of sprawl, which is causing all kinds of other externalities. I'm not sure what they. I'm not sure what they do with their revenue from um, from the the taxation of cars. I think it, they do have a very comprehensive public transit system. Um, in terms of the Central Provident Fund, that's actually like a welfare type of fund that that people uh, will use for their retirement, but they can also use it to buy uh, housing as as uh, a source of of money for for housing. And so that also helps to support a very uh, vibrant um, public housing system in Singapore. Karen? Well, I had another perspective on the issue of land, uh, one, one scale up at, at the global scale, because a lot of the discussion about land has been within the city. One of the things that I found in, in my work is that, and this goes back to the real estate companies and developers, is that we're now in a global market for land. And as it used to be that companies moved to China largely because the government gave them incentives that were primarily economic incentives. But some of these incentives now are land-related incentives. So in fact, the work that we had done with Jones Lang LaSalle, they mentioned that their, you know, some of their clients were negotiating, that they were negotiating on behalf of their clients uh, with local governments on what parcels of land how much land, at getting access, you know, agricultural land. And the, on, the, on another side, when we talk to the private sector, whether it's IT or otherwise, when they talk about moving to another city, like from Bangalore to Pune, the two things that come up are the increasing price of labor and the increasing price of land, or lack of access. So I think that's another element of this, is just to think that we're in this global market, or companies are in this global market for land. Other questions, thoughts, please. Thank you, sir. I want to ask this. Uh, I hope it's not out of place. What would be our response to any nation, any government, or any region that feels the activities of its people threatening human existence is not a concern to him. Uh, from what uh, Susan delivered, I consider 63% enormous. Uh, if a region or a government thinks that is inconsequential to him, what would be our response and reaction to that? Thoughts? I, 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 it seems to me that you've, you've managed to stun the entire audience and all the presenters, uh, which is a, an amazing feat in and of itself. The, I, I think the only thing that I, I would even begin to venture to say in response is, is actually building on, on uh, Susie's response to your 
uh, to your original question. Uh, for, for some of these risks to health and welfare that are, in a sense, uh, that are, in a very real sense, a consequence of the rapidity and, and scale of, of urbanization and economic development that we've seen, governments are, rel they can, it's difficult for them to focus on uh, a lot of different goals at a time, and for particularly for governments that are focusing on sort of generating capital and generating uh, income growth, uh, there is a there is a tendency to leave other problems till later, you know, and and we we all recognize that that um, particularly large institutions will respond to crisis much more, in a sense, more easily than they will respond to a, sort of the chronic growth of, of, uh, of problems. Uh, and I'll just use an, just an analogy. Um, I lived for m many years in the state of Virginia, um, whose economy for a couple of centuries uh, was essentially built around tobacco. Uh, and it was only in the last 10 years uh, that there was finally a political and economic accommodation reached with the tobacco industry uh, to begin to actually ratchet down tobacco production. And this is long after the health risks of tobacco were clearly recognized. And, and, uh, and the final, in a sense, the final solution um, was uh, the transfer of very large sums of money um, from the industry to the state, uh, and that, and then the, in a sense, the state providing ways for tobacco farmers to grow other crops, uh, to transition to other ways of making a living off the land. Um, but this was a very, very long process, uh, and so it's, it's hard for me to anticipate that that even in places where these health risks are in fact quite acute. Um, that it will be, it still seems to me that it will be a very long process. And what, what, can, other, what can other countries and governments do except to encourage people to, uh, to move in that direction? Um, or if governments are actually facing emigration because people don't want to live in that environment, uh, some, this idea is not so foreign. They'll, they'll, ha they'll begin to have to do something about it. Other perspectives? Eugenia. This maybe relates to the first panel of the day, the idea of the city, and I think, I don't know if any of the speakers are still with us now, but I think that other speakers actually can probably pitch in. Um, one of the ideas that we had uh, when we were conceiving of this conference was, are the theories of urbanization and urban management that have been developed in the West still applicable and useful as a toolkit in Asia? Can Asia actually become the metropole uh, and not any longer be the colony? Many of you are from institutions in this country, and you go to India, you go to China, sometimes you are being taught by foreign governments uh, to give uh, uh, opinions. But yesterday during dinner, Annette was mentioning that, oh, in Beijing, you know, they are taking their own uh, approach to things, they don't really care what we think. I would like to know if uh, that is the case, where is the metropole and where is the colony in terms of uh, the idea of the city? If uh, it is true, as Anthony, uh, Tony was saying before, that uh, now the Bari Center is moving to Asia and that uh, the kind of issues that we are dealing with are so different from those of Asia, uh, how do planners now work uh, this conundrum? So I am working on a paper on exactly this issue. And it was actually going to be my final observation around the conference. Is um, my, I have a very big concern around this issue, and that is that we're not only using 19th, 18th, 17th century conceptual tools to study urbanization. So our conceptualization is wrong. But at a more maybe even fundamental level, I don't think we're training students and practitioners to create solutions that are appropriate, that are actually real solutions. 
And so the, the image that I have of urbanization in Asia right now is that it's a, it's a plane that's taken off and now we're trying to redesign the plane. It's already taken okay. off. And we're using these tools from another century, from another place that's actually not even the right tool. And I think there is an enormous urgency for researchers and educators and institutions to really rethink the kind of education that's necessary. I've been very critical in saying that, you know, when I look at the international landscape of places where students can get a training to, to solve these problems, okay, they can go to an urban studies department, but then the stuff that they learn isn't necessarily going to be applicable to the stuff that this conference talked about. They can go to a geography department, it's gonna be a, a small section, or environmental studies program, and it's a small slice. And that's a very piecemeal, incremental approach to solving the problem that, again, remember the plane's already in flight, so we have to work a little bit faster. So I agree that these, we don't have the right tools, we're using the wrong ones, and that in terms of, I mean, there's a research part of this, which is we're using the wrong research tools, but then in terms of just practice, we need to, I mean, I don't know what the right tools are, um, but I think we need to work together and, and be creative about forming new teams of, maybe it's you know, people who work on governance, with finance, with um, you know, ecosystem science, uh, because it's going to require really new ways to think about the solution space. And I'll send you that paper when I'm done. <laughs> so, very uh, excellent question. Um, I think it's, it's a fascinating question because I think right now, as societies are urbanizing so quickly, uh, they are looking around and they're looking for models uh, to emulate. And I think the US and Europe are still prominent models, but they're definitely not the only models anymore. I think uh, models that get talked about now are Singapore, which I've just mentioned, uh, China, uh, which has come up a number of times, just as places that are, are growing so quickly. I mean, for me, I, I think what, what, we, what we need to, to do, what we need to do, what we need to train uh, our students to do, and some of the students are coming from other parts of the world, is to ask the right kind of questions questions about particular places. How do people in this place, this city, in this society, use urban space? What is the history of this place? What are the social relations and the political structures in this place? Um, what are the interests that are at stake? What's fair with respect to how we adjudicate those interests? I think those are the, the kinds of things that we need to train people to do, because what I'm concerned about is that, that, uh, that and I've written a paper on the Singapore model specifically in this regard, uh, that, that societies are looking around for models and they're borrowing willy-nilly based on some abstract notion of success that might not be really related to have a, a relationship to what their society is trying to accomplish. So I really think we need to understand context and we need to train professionals and students to, to think about context very carefully. Agree that it's a, it's a very important question when it comes to um, this idea of modeling, this idea of you know looking at a metropole, and um, and this actually bring bring us back to the whole uh, notions of of dependency. Really, um, there's a strong feeling today that that there's a limit to the idea of modernization, uh, and modernization has been a major <coughs> paradigm in 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 many developing countries. This idea of stages of development. You know, after so many years, there's a feeling that that this seems to be not the real paradigm. This is a paradigm that is just going to mislead uh, everyone. So I guess one one major consciousness that begins to emerge in what we might call the global south is the limit of of growth. Uh, that in fact that is the kind of a, a new consciousness that needs to be in some way uh, uh, promoted. Um, and there's also a realization that that it is really not possible for, say, you know, the post-colonial cities to become like a metropole uh, because because the world has been structured in a very uneven way. That in fact it has been sustained in that manner. Uh, so you really have to, in some way, find a new paradigm rather than following the so-called uh, the metropole sort of a paradigm uh, because that just won't happen. 
the whole international division of labor has made it clear that you know it is just not going to uh, work when it comes to uh, the equal distributions of, of resources and, and all kind of uh, equal uh, treatment. Uh, there's a, a kind of a power relations almost to, you know, to maintain certain hierarchy, uh, even in the, the so-called uh, the city system uh, of the world. Um, so I guess there are two sets of limits that that seems to be entering the consciousness of of say intellectuals in the global south um, is the limit of ecology, the environmental limit. Uh, and the other one is actually labor, that labor is now limited. There's a systematic deruralization. Uh, people are now actually asking to be paid more uh, than before. So, and these are the two components that in fact have been used by what you might call you know, the whole uh, capitalist system, uh, but they are, the whole system is encountering the limit because people begin to be more and more aware um, of the ecological limit and this whole exploitation of what we call cheap labor. So a sort of a, a, a new consciousness has emerged and I think that has to be you know, put into practice in terms of the education and so on and so forth to really look for a different kind of of urbanism uh, that is not centered on just just keep growing, but uh, centered on on the limit of growth and and see a kind of a, a way of uh, looking into the future. Ah, in the back. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, I am uh, Humphrey Fellow, uh, Faisal Mazhar uh, from Pakistan. Uh, my point is about Adil Najam's uh, uh, reference to Islamabad. Uh, actually, Islamabad was the city which was built from the scratch. So you can say it was easy to build the city when you when the place was there when there were just forests and you know jungles were there. But when but uh, in Pakistan we also have good examples like Karachi. We have good examples like Lahore, and those places were basically you you see they were in a mess. Uh, like few years back, but after the involvement of uh, the central government, the provincial government, uh, they were in a uh, the people, the mayor of Karachi was able to build a very good city, the bridges and everything. There was a lot of land grabbing, uh, there were like a lot of uh, other problems, and there was a lot of urbanization because you know the, uh, the situation in Karachi, people uh, moved to Lahore as well as to Karachi because of jobs, as well as when the uh, situation in the north uh, areas gets worse, people move to Karachi and Lahore. So my point is uh, that if you want to like improve the situation in a city, if you uh, if you want to like if you want to plan the urbanization in a city, the uh, the central government and the provincial government need to like put in very good efforts. Uh, if you like rely on NGOs, they can be they cannot be very much fruitful. Uh, thank you. Th th that's the point I wanted to make. Thanks. Great. And I'm sorry, the glare. It's very difficult to see back there. But I know there's a question back there somewhere. Okay, my name is Nafisa Halim. I'm a faculty member at the uh, Department of Global Health at Boston University. So I have one observation of the major themes that we may have not covered and would be nice to complement a discussion about the how the formal and informal social networks at the neighborhood and the family level are changing with uh, migration um, and urbanization, right? So I'm thinking about crime, I'm thinking about violence, I'm thinking about violence against women, in particular, who are more visible in the urban areas because they are participating in the labor force more. So I was just thinking maybe a discussion on that and on what these consequences would be for the physical, uh, mental, or sexual and reproductive health and well-being would be a nice complement to, uh, uh, to a conference on urbanization. Thank you. Thank you. Ob observations um, on on these points at all? It's a it's a it's a it's a very very interesting uh, suggestion. And you're right. It's not an aspect that that uh, we really sort of delved into um, uh, in this conference. Uh, I think that's I think, however, that's emblematic of a, of the challenge of trying to structure w one conference on one day to look at such a wide range of issues. Um, I think one of the things that we've seen um, from all of the uh, presentations and discussions with the panels and, and now in this discussion um, is that the challenges 
of urbanization, and particularly on the scales and at the rates at which we're seeing it occur um, uh, in Asia, um, present us with a set, with challenges to how we understand cities and urbanism in general. It's clear that our old mental models of what urbanism means are not necessarily appropriate uh, to this new reality. Uh, present us with challenges about uh, that do not come to us in the, essentially in the shape of the disciplinary and departmental silos that we were, as academics, that we were all raised in and, and, uh, and, 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 and occasionally struggle with, that these are challenges that really, um, intellectual challenges that cut across um, a, a broad range of uh, disciplinary expertise and that we have to think differently about everything from economics to the environment uh, to social, political, um, and public health uh, issues in a, in a more integrated way. And how we, tra how we train our students to do that um, is absolutely a live issue. It's not exactly clear how that should work. Uh, but I think it's nevertheless important because this is a phenomenon that is uh, with us to stay. Um, as Karen pointed out, the plane has taken off. Uh, if we're trying to redesign the plane in flight, that's a hard task. Uh, but it's, it's one that I think is, is uh, at the end of the day, is going to be necessary. Uh, so with that, uh, I think what I'd like to do is uh, adjourn. Uh, we have a, a reception uh, set up uh, outside. And so I would encourage everybody to, uh, to stay, to uh, en enjoy the reception, and, and hopefully continue these discussions. So thank you very much.